Our assigned <clears throat> topic is the character of the harvest work. And our subject today has two parts. First, there's the general reaping and separating work, gathering the fruit, the good crop of wheat produced during the gospel age and destroying the bad crop that is the tares. Jesus tells this story in the parable of the wheat and the tares, which we will consider first. Part two of our subject is the special testing and sifting of the wheat or sanctuary class after they've been separated from the tares at the end of the, of the age or the harvest. We'll consider two parables to tell this story. First, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, and second, the wedding garment test in Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Before considering our first parable, we want to read the opening paragraph of the work of the harvest, which is study six in the third volume on page 135. Here's the quote. We want to make a couple observations after we read this paragraph. Harvest is a term which gives general gives a general idea as to what the work should be expected to, excuse me, as to what work should be expected to transpire between the dates 1874 and 1914. It is a time of reaping rather than sowing, a time of testing, of reckoning, of settlement, and of rewarding. The harvest of the Jewish age being a type of the harvest of this age, observation and comparison of the various features of the harvest afford very clear ideas concerning the work to be accomplished in the present harvest. In that harvest, our Lord's special teachings were such as to gather the wheat who were such already and to separate the chaff of the Jewish nation from the wheat. And his doctrines became also the seeds for the new dispensation, which opened shortly after the nation of Israel was cast off at Pentecost. End of quote. The first observation is that the word harvest defines the work to be done, and that is reaping rather than sowing. It also is a time of testing, of reckoning, of settlement, uh, and of rewarding. The next observation is that by considering the Jewish harvest, we will know what to expect in the gospel harvest. So what do we see in the Jewish harvest? We see that the Lord was present in the flesh as the chief reaper. And his special teachings, gathering the wheat that were wheat already, separating them from the chaff of the Jewish nation. So what can we expect in this harvest? We can expect our Lord to be present, not in the flesh, but as a spirit being, as the chief reaper. And his special teachings, present truth, the harvest message, will gather the wheat that were wheat already, separating them from the tares of, the, of nominal Christendom. Now, let's take a closer look at the opening sentence, which reads, harvest is a term Harvest is a term which gives a general idea as to what work should be expected to transpire between the dates 1874 and 1914. Brother Russell expected, Brother Russell's expectation in 1890, when he published the third volume, was that the harvest would be completed in 40 years, from 1874 to 1914. In connection with this expectation, let's read the 1916 foreword of the third volume, uh, Roman numeral I, paragraph three. There, Brother Russell wrote, the work of harvest has progressed and is still progressing, even though at one time we suppose that the harvest work would have been fully accomplished with the ending of the times of the Gentiles. That was merely a supposition which proved to be without warrant for the thrusting in of the sickle of truth and the gathering in of the ripe grains has been progressing since 1914 
as never before. So then on October 1st, 1916, Brother Russell clearly states that the harvest was not over, but had has been progressing since October 1914 as never before. One last quote on this point from reprint 5950, titled The Harvest is Not Ended, a September 1916 Watchtower article. This is the opening paragraph. Some of us, some of us were quite strongly convinced that the harvest work would be, would be ended by now, but our expectations must not be allowed to weigh anything against the facts. The fact is that the harvest work is going grandly on. It is not ended by any means. As far as our present judgment goes, it would appear that there is a considerable harvest work yet to be done. Brethren, and that's the end of the quote. Brethren, when Brother, Brother Russell looked at the events of his day, he saw that his original expectation concerning the harvest didn't fit what he was seeing. Namely, that others were daily coming into blessed relationship with the Lord under a covenant of sacrifice. So his conclusion was, the harvest is going grandly on. And brethren, when we look at the events of our day, what do we see? We see others coming into a blessed relationship with the Lord under the covenant of sacrifice, not so much in the USA and Europe as it was in Brother Russell's day, but in other parts of the world, India, Africa, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Croatia, and so on. When we read the harvest reports from these countries, and see so many dear ones joining the brotherhood, our conclusion is the harvest work is going grandly on. And are we not glad to know that others are coming into a blessed relationship with the Lord under the covenant of sacrifice? And can't we say that we're glad to note the zeal of our brethren as we see them engage in the harvest work? of finding and separating the final grains of wheat and binding the tares. Brethren, what a privilege is still ours to do our part in our little corner of the harvest field and to co-labor together with the Lord in this great work. Now let's consider our first parable of wheat and tares, a farming story told by Jesus to reveal the great work of the gospel age. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 24 to 30. Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in the field? From whence then hath thou that hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou that we go and gather, gather them up? But he said, Nay, least while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. But let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus tells us the story of the entire gospel age in seven verses here. Then he explains the parable using seven more verses. Let's read this explanation found in Matthew 13, verses 36 to 43. Then Jesus said to the multitude, sent the multitude away. 
and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them that do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. This story of the gospel age has two great chapters, if you will. The beginning work called sowing and the ending work called reaping. This story in a nutshell is about the kingdom of God, the spiritual phase, which was planted at the beginning of the gospel age, grew as the embryo kingdom over 1800 years. Then it was time to reap the fruitage in the harvest or end of the age. You know the story well, brethren. Jesus and his disciples after him sowed the good seed, the truth, the message of the high calling in his field, that is the world. This good seed produced wheat, that is the children of the kingdom, Christians. Then an enemy, Satan, came along while men slept, that is, after the apostles died, and sowed bad seed, that is, errors, false doctrines, in the wheat field, producing tares, or false or imitation Christians. His servants, the wheat class, seeing the weeds all over the wheat field, wondered what to do. Should we pull these weeds? Should we separate these false Christians from the true ones? No, don't do that, was our Lord's response. Why? Because you'll root up the wheat. Because their roots are intertwined with these tares. Instead, let both grow together until the harvest, which comes at the end of the world or age. And, ah, now, dear friends, we've arrived at our subject, the character or essence of the harvest work the work of our day, which Jesus explains in verse 30, saying, in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, that is the angels or messengers of verse 39, and that's us, brethren, and to us, he says, first, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. All right, there's the work. The question is, how do we, the reapers, do this work? The good news is we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just need to copy the work that was done already in the Jewish harvest. When Jesus sent his disciples to the professed people of God, that is natural Israel, to reap the fruitage of the labor done by the patriarchs and the prophets. They were to find the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They were not to turn goats into sheep. And their special message, the sickle, used to test and separate the wheat from the chaff was the kingdom of heaven is at, ha is at hand and the king is present. Matthew 10. 5 to 7, John 12, 15. Likewise, in this harvest, Jesus sends out his disciples to do this reaping work, separating wheat and tares with the special message, the kingdom of heaven is at hand and the king is present. We see then as reapers, 
living in the harvest, we must do the reaping work among those in Christendom who profess to be the true church. Our reaping tool is the sickle of present truth, the harvest message, designed specially to separate the wheat from tares. Doing this work is also designed to ripen and develop us as wheat, preparing us for the heavenly garner, the barn condition of our parable. The apostle tells us so in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. There he says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward. And how is that? According to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. This statement, every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, calls to mind the parable of the talents and the rewarding of those who labored, that is, put their talents to use for the Lord. This labor made them acceptable or ready for the reward. So we must labor and we must do the harvest work. And what an awesome thought is expressed in verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. The apostle reveals here that God is working with us, and we are working with him to find the saints, the wheat class, and guiding them, fitting them for the spiritual kingdom. And at the same time, we're binding the tares with the same sickle of truth. In this connection, Brother Russell writes in the third volume, page 216. Here's the quote. And strange to say, it is this message of God's loving provision in the ransom for the restitution of all things by and through Christ Jesus and his glorified body, the church, God's kingdom, this message which should rejoice, refresh, and unite all loving Christian hearts, that is, to develop and draw into heart union the true class only to test them and to separate them from the nominal mass. End of quote. That being said, the question is, how can we practically do this harvest work? How do we co-labor together with God? We can start by looking at our own experience by considering how the sickle of truth was used to separate us and those around us. For me, the sickle of truth was wielded in the form of a TV show where I heard a truth message, then I sent for the free offering. The faithful co-laborer sent the literature and also sent my name to a brother who called me on the telephone, and we had Bible studies over the phone. Afterwards, he and his wife came to our home and asked if we had any questions on the Bible. My wife, Connie, did. She asked, where is my father? You see, Connie was eight years old when her father died, and he was a good man, but he didn't go to church. And she was tormented by the thought that he was being tormented in hell because he wasn't born again. The fundamental teaching of the Pentecostal church that we had been attending in answer to Connie's question, the present truth doctrine of the two salvations, a heavenly salvation and earthly salvation, was presented to us. And we were thrilled to know that Jesus died a ransom for all, and nobody is left out of God's loving plan, and that nobody burns in a place called hell because that place doesn't exist. And we continued to study present truth, or as we continued to study present truth, 
and meet with the brethren, we were separated from the nominal Christian professors. Being excited about the truth, we told it to others, our parents, brothers, sisters, relatives, friends, neighbors, co-workers. A few, my younger brother and his sister, my brother-in-law and a friend, they loved it and received it like we did, but most rejected and opposed it and became more bound to their church and its doctrine by the same sickle of truth, the same wonderful message. Our class witnessed the truth at fair booths, so we learned to use the sickle of truth at fairs to find wheat and bind tares. Reading about coal portering in the reprints, I went door to door using the sickle of truth to find those with ears to hear. We were encouraged to preach the truth by the printed page, passing out tracts in the neighborhood, at the bank, the hardware store, or where, wherever we went. What a simple and wonderful way to wield the sickle of truth. You can witness to a thousand people in one year by passing out three tracts a day. Bible student websites work 24 seven and wield the sword of the spirit all over the world. Our class website, Bible Today, was designed and is maintained by a very talented brother who sends new truth articles out every week called eblast to our mailing list. Not many of us have the talent to design and maintain a website, but some can answer questions that come in and others can send out truth literature requested. And we all can pray for the Lord's blessing upon this amazing harvest tool. One dear sister in our class has an online store where she thrusts in the sickle of truth and does the harvest work selling present truth literature to truth seekers. Others write letters to witness the truth. Some use social media. Our dear brethren overseas are very active thrusting in the sickle and doing the harvest work. Translating the harvest message, producing and conducting studies electronically and in person, traveling far and wide as the Lord's ambassadors. And many brethren all over the world send funds to support this harvest work. And no doubt, all of us pray daily for the harvest work and for God's kingdom to come. Brethren, We've listed over a dozen ways to join in the harvest work from our own little experience and as part of one small class. And each of us and each of you can make your own list from your own experience and from class activities and your observations of how the sickle of truth is being thrust, thrust in. And with these many ways before our minds, we can and must thrust in the sickle of present truth and join in the harvest work of separating out the wheat from the tares. And at, and at the same time, excuse me, we're binding tares, which are the majority who will react against the truth, which binds them tighter together to their denominational beliefs. The terror class <clears throat> see the truth as a threat because it destroys their entire faith structure, which is based upon lies, superstition, and man-made doctrine. The truth brings to light that their claims and false teachings don't hold up to the true light, to the truth found in the Bible. This upsets them because it takes away their false hopes. So they cling more tightly to their traditions and popular errors for strength. This was my older brother's reaction. The more we discussed the truth together, the more opposed he became. The truth bound him more tightly to his denominational beliefs. Now, I don't blame my older brother for his negative response to the truth because this is the normal reaction from those who believe that 
they're true Christians and we're not because this is what they've been taught and assured in their churches. Along this line, Brother Russell writes in the third volume on page 147. Here's the quote. As we examine this subject, we find that many of these tares are little to be blamed for their false position as imitated, imitation wheat, nor do many of them know that they are tares that, excuse me, nor do many of them know that the tares are not the real church, for they regard the little flock of consecrated wheat as extremists and fanatics. And when compared with the tear multitude, the Lord and his apostles and all the wheat certainly do appear to be extremists and fanatics, if the majority, the tares, be in the right. End of quote. We see then that the truth unites the sects together in an effort to uphold their system of error. Their burning takes place when these professed Christians are finally shown by the sickle of truth what a true Christian is. And when they realize they're not Christians, they will stop imitating Christians and will return to the world where they belong. We think that the timing of this burning of the terrors is when the religious element of Babylon is destroyed in the great earthquake of Revelation 16, verses 16 to 19. In conclusion, we see the character of the harvest work is reaping rather than sowing, separating the true from the false with the sickle of truth. And these same strong truths, this meet in due season, will also do a further ripening and separating work among the wheat or sanctuary class. This brings us to part two of our subject, the special testing and sifting of the wheat in the end of the age or harvest period. We'll consider two parables to tell this story. The first, first let's consider the wise and foolish virgins found in Matthew, the 25th chapter. Let's read the first 13 verses. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto the ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. And they, and they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil in them. But the wise took oil in their vessel with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a a cry made, behold, the bridegroom, go ye out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, not so, lest there be no, not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour. Brethren, we don't have time to consider this par parable in detail, except to say that the focus of this parable is the virgin class, the consecrated, separated from Babylon and living at the time of the Lord's presence in the harvest of the gospel age. And, that's, and that is that it shows clearly a testing and separating among the sanctuary class who alone have a knowledge of the bridegroom's presence. And it's this special feature of the harvest message that will test and prove each individual. The wise virgins 
who are full of faith and fervent love and the spirit of prompt obedience are separated from the foolish virgins who allow their first love and fervency of spirit to cool and their faith and promptness of obedience consequently to slip or decrease. Both have made a covenant of sacrifice unto death, but only the wise live in harmony with their covenant, earnestly watching and praying, studying their Bibles to know the Father's plan and will for them, and watching their lives to take care that they are walking as closely as they can in the footsteps of the master and developing his character. Being awake and watching, trimming their lamps, they hear the master's knock through the word of prophecy, announcing the Lord's presence. What an epic announcement. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Revelation 3 and verse 20. These wise virgins open the door and feast upon the glorious truth. The Lord is present to take his bride and set up his kingdom. The wedding being united to their bridegroom who has returned to receive them becomes the focus and inspiration of their lives. And they order their conduct and affairs of life in harmony with their faith spending their time wisely and perfecting their character, doing the harvest work as the Lord's messengers and helping the other virgins trim their lamps and making the final preparations for the wedding. This singular focus and purpose of life prepares them to stand whatever tests the Lord may see, see fit to apply to prove their loyalty and faithfulness. The foolish virgins, on the other hand, are separated from the wise, sifted out of the predestined number who make up the bride. We're not given details in this parable of when and what will separate these two classes. We're only told that the lamps of the foolish virgins are gone out, and they needed to go out and buy oil that is the spirit of consecration for themselves. But, but these details can be flushed out in 2 Kings, the second chapter, verses 1 through 14, by considering the separation of Elijah from Elisha, who Brother Russell felt represented these two classes of virgins. And what Elijah's closing experience, and that Elijah's closing experiences parallel the closing experiences of the last members of the church, the feet in the flesh. We can only briefly discuss this lesson in connection with our study of the sifting and separating of the virgin or sanctuary class. But here are a few references for a more detailed study on your own. Reprint 5950, 5845, 5772, question book 259, and the second volume, study eight. Now, considering Elijah's final experiences, first we see in, and, and we're not going to have time to read this account, uh, we're sorry for that as well. So in 2 Kings, Chapter two, the first seven verses. First, we see that that Elijah was taken to four successes, so successive places: Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, and then Jordan. At each of these places, Elijah thought that the Lord would take him. In his in this connection, Brother Russell writes in reprint fifty eight forty five. Here's the quote. And so it has been with us. During this harvest of the age, the Lord, through his word, has seemed to send his people to four different points of time 
1874, 1878, 1881, and 1914. At each of these points of time, the watching saints who realized that the end of the age was upon the church have thought that the change might come. But, then that's the end of the quote. But the change or the completion of the church didn't come, brethren. Now, skipping down a bit in the same article, we continue reading from 5845. And I quote, what do we expect? We expect just what the picture points out. Of late, we have been thinking considerably of what took place when Elijah and Elisha came to the River Jordan. They stopped there and stood talking. Something must be done before they could go further. For the Lord's people have been standing for a time since we came to October 1914. Then, verse 8, Elijah took his mantle wrapped it together, and smote the waters of Jordan. The waters divided to the right and left, and the prophets went over dry shot. After they had crossed, they went on talking together. They had received no further instructions from the Lord. They simply walked on. Suddenly, verse 11, the chariot of fire appeared and separated them. And Elijah was taken away in the chariot by a whirlwind. We see here that Elijah and Elisha came to Jordan and stood there for a time. Then Elijah had three final experiences. He smote the water of Jordan. First, he smote the water of Jordan with his mantle. The waters were divided and the prophets went across. Second, as they walked on together, the fiery chariot appeared and separated Elijah from Elisha. And third, and lastly, Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind. So what does this signify? What is the antitypical lesson for us, brethren? For a possible answer, let's consider a paragraph from reprint 5950, which reads, it will be after the smiting of Jordan, after the division of the people by the message of truth and the mantle of Elijah's power, that the separation of the church into two classes will take place. Thereafter, the Elijah class, the little flock class, will be clearly manifested, separated, and separate and distinct from the great company class. The division uh, be it remembered, will be caused by the fiery chariot, some very severe trying ordeal, which the elect class will promptly accept and enter into. The Elisha class, holding back from the persecution, but not drawing back to sin or to repudiation of the Lord. It will be but a little later on that the whirlwind, probably anarchy, will bring about the change of the Elijah class, end of quote. Brother Russell saw the smiting as a future event and that it would be after the smiting work that the spirit begotten would be separated into two classes. To help us understand these details, let's consider the closing experiences of John the Baptist, who Brother Russell said, was really a finishing out in a measure of the type begun in the person and work of Elijah. And that John's work at the first advent foreshadowed the closing work of the church at the second advent. For more details, consider the second volume, page 253. So when we examine John's closing experiences, we see how they correspond to Elijah's closing experiences, giving us further insight into the closing experiences of the final feet members of the church. John had three final experiences. One, he publicly reproved the unlawful union of Herod and Herodias. 
Two, he was in prison for this reproving action. And three, he was beheaded in prison. The reproving message of John indicates the nature of Elijah's smiting message to, to be the public reproval of the future illicit union between church and state, which was clearly Brother Russell's expectation for references, see the comments under Revelation, the 13th chapter, verses 11 to 18, and Revelation 16, verse 13. The imprisonment of John indicates the nature of Elijah's fiery trial, both of them representing the laying down of earthly life by the last body members and their passing beyond the veil, thus completing the church. Taking these thoughts back to our parable, we see the two classes of virgins standing together since 1914. That is, They've been continuing on to this day, waiting, watching, and talking together, holding on to the same precious truths found in the six volumes of scripture studies and the reprints in the entire harvest message. And nothing radically different has been accomplished by the true sheep since then. Ahead of us lies the antitypes of Elijah's and John's three last experiences. The smiting message by the Elijah or wise virgin class pointing out the illicit union between church and state when they receive their hour of power, Revelation 17 and verse two. The Lord will set the stage for this smiting message to be heard that will divide the people some, the common people liking it. Others, the ruling class, the civil, religious, and financial powers hating it because it threatens their power and their control. It will be after this message of truth is delivered that the church is separated into two classes. This separation is caused by the fiery chariot, that is, some very severe trying experience that the wise virgins will promptly enter into, while Elisha, the foolish virgin class, draws back from the persecution, but they don't draw back to sin or to the repudiation of the Lord. Then comes the final experience, the whirlwind, probably anarchy, Brother Russell suggests, bringing about the change of the Elijah or wise virgin class. After this, Elisha took up the mantle of Elijah, 2 Kings 2, 13. Receiving this power seems to correspond to the foolish virgins getting their oil, Matthew 25 and verse 10. They receive a special blessing picturing the spirit of the wise virgins the spirit of full consecration. They now become devoted, zealous servants of the Lord, allowing them to pass through the great tribulation and proving their love and fidelity towards God, they receive the palm branch of victory and a place before the throne where they shall be fed by the lamb and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This story is told in Revelation, the seventh chapter, verses 9 through 17. Our final parable is the wedding garment test. In this parable, Jesus shows a still further testing of the sanctuary class, an individual inspection of those in the guest chamber, in which some will be rejected and some accepted. Brother Russell describes this, these guests this way in the third volume on page 198. Here's the quote. They are the wheat 
reaped and gathered out from among the tares. The wise virgins separated from the foolish. They have heard and received the harvest truths and are rejoicing by faith in anticipation of the glory and blessing to follow their full union with the Lord. Hitherto, they all have run well, but until he reach the end of his course, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. End of quote. Brethren, we are the guests in this guest chamber. Let us be inspired by this thought and make ourselves ready for the wedding. Before reading this parable, let's read another quote from the third volume, page 199, where Brother Russell gives us a word picture of this guest or antechamber. Here's the quote. In this antechamber, this favored time and condition, brilliantly lit, lighted, with the clear unfolding of divine truth now due, both the facilities for and the inspiration to the final ad adornment and complete readiness uh, for the marriage feast are granted. But nevertheless, the parable shows that even under these special favorable conditions, some here, represented by one, will insult the host, the king, by despising and taking off the wedding garment. What a description of the favorable time and condition in which we, the saints, live in, are living in since the time of our Lord's return. And although we have all the truth and inspiration to make ourselves ready for the wedding, the caution is that one, that is a class, will despise and take off the wedding garment, God's provision for our acceptance, the ransom sacrifice. Now let's consider our parable in Matthew 20, 22 verses 1 through 13. And again, we're sorry we won't have time to read this uh, parable, uh, which is very familiar to us. Uh, just We will just have to uh, discuss uh, the high points. In verse 2, Jesus tells us that the culminating, the culmination of the gospel age work is the marriage of the great king Jehovah's son, Jesus, to his bride. And as we understand it, after this marriage, Jehovah's son and his bride will then rule as kings and priests over the earth and bless all mankind. Verses three to nine tell the story of the calling of the bride, this high heavenly calling, this invitation that went out during the gospel age in three parts. First, to the Jewish nation during the three and a half years of our Lord's ministry from 29 AD to 33 AD. The second invitation was, went to individual Jews after the nation was rejected during the three and a half years following the crucifixion of our Lord from 33 AD to 36 AD. The third invitation went to the Gentile nations outside of Israel, starting with Cornelius in 36 AD. This general call went out until 1878. Verse 10 tells us that at that time, the wedding was furnished with, we think, 144,000 guests. And we remember that these guests were in the light of present truth as they feasted on the prospect of the marriage before them in the brilliant light of the clear unfolding of truth, the harvest message. Now let's consider the guests and their requirements. Let's read Matthew 22, verses 11 and 12. 
And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, friend, how comest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. The first requirement was that you had to be invited to be a guest. Next, you had to put on the provided wedding garment to go in. What, what's the lesson for us? First, we must be invited by the great King Jehovah, as Jesus tells us in John the sixth chapter, verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. The Father sent the invitation. He draws us out of the world to be of the bride for his son. And this drawing of God is through his word. In our parable, all the guests have accepted the invitation and have put on the wedding garment, picturing the robe of Christ's righteousness imputed to those who accept Jesus' ransom sacrifice and then take the next step of full consecration unto death. So all the guests are properly attired, showing that they're spirit begotten and accepted in the beloved, Ephesians 1 and verse 6. Next comes the inspection of each individual, and one is rejected because he took off his wedding garment, as brought out in verse 11. How do we understand this? What does this represent? Well, it represents those of the spirit begotten class who once believed in the ransom and afterwards rejected it or rejected their covenant of sacrifice. Of this class, Brother Russell writes in the third volume on page 204, and I quote, but since the king came in, since 1878, the parallel in time to our Lord's typical assumption of the office of king of the Jews, Matthew 21, 1 to 13, the inspection of the guests and the testing of their appreciation of the wedding robe have been in progress. And while more of the wise virgins are still learning of the bridegroom's presence and joyfully coming in to the feast, some of those already in are proving themselves unworthy to stay, to stay in, and have been and are being bound hand and foot, and their appreciation and apprehension of present truth of the Lord's presence and the present and future work begin to grow more and more dim, as borne along by false reasonings upon false premises. They gradually or rapidly, according to temperament, gravitate toward worldly views of things, the outer darkness of the world, when contrasted with the inner light now accessible to the properly robed saints. And doubtless all the virgins who come in must be tested upon this subject. End of quote. Brethren, it's sad but true that there are those since 1878 and onward who once loved and appreciated the ransom, but afterwards have cast it off. The lesson and caution for us is to remain humble and remember that we're only acceptable because our filthy rags, our imperfections are covered by Christ's robe of righteousness. So let us wear our robes and embroider them with our own good works, developing the fruits and graces of the Holy Spirit. And finally, dear brethren, with this glorious prospect before us, let us lay aside the weights and hindrances of this life and run with patience the race that is set before us keeping our eyes on Jesus, our hope, our Savior, who is the author and finisher of our faith. 
and let us help one another to make ourselves ready for the wedding. May the Lord add his blessing.